Hi friends, welcome to EduTab. So welcome to this lecture where we are going to have a discussion regarding the classification of fishery resources. Now uh, the previous videos that you had seen regarding the taxonomy of fish and the classification of ocean zones plus a video on aquaculture. The understanding that is acquired during those videos is actually going to help you a lot when you come across this particular lecture. So it is very important that you go through those videos before coming to this one because we are going to be using certain terms which you will be able to understand only when you have seen the earlier videos and, uh, and notes. So friends, what we are going to do is first we shall have a look at the various terms which are involved in fisheries. Okay, we'll just have a quick look at it so that you get an idea regarding what these terms mean. Then we shall move on to see the classification of fishery resources. Okay, so the first thing is when we talk about fisheries, this is basically a very broader term. Okay, the entire setup that involves the aspect of harvesting or raising a fish that is studied in parts. For example, you would study the type of boats that are used for fishing right you would also concentrate upon the type of fish that you require and how do you actually go about uh, capturing them right the purpose of cultivation whether it is for ornamental purposes whether it is for consumption right and uh, uh, what are the various ways in which the fish can be harvested so these are all the aspects that you're going to see as part of fishery so you can call it a very broader term okay and there's one another term which is known as ichthyology Okay, so basically when we tell this term, it is dealing with that branch of science, okay, that deals with the study of fishes. So when you go to this branch, particular branch, that is ichthyology, it actually deals, uh, it goes deeper into the details, like it would uh, go and study the aspects of pollution, okay, on the rearing of fish. It would come up with the various breeding techniques that are there, okay, what is the chemistry of water, what are the parameters that needs to be there. So when you talk about fisheries it encompasses a broader term and we are more related to the practicality of what we are doing right but when you go to ichthyology it becomes a discipline of study okay under science so you need to know the difference and you need to understand the various uh, technicalities uh, involved in both these terms that we are used So next we shall move on under fisheries. There are a couple of terms that you would encounter and uh, having a clear understanding of those terms is important. Uh, like you have three terms which are mostly used that is pisciculture, aquaculture and mariculture, right? So you need, there is a distinct uh, difference uh, that exists. So you need to know about that difference. For that purpose, we have uh, in discussion these terms out here. So when you talk about pisciculture, you're specifically referring to the rearing of fishes by artificial means. Okay. So when I say by artificial means, you are giving them an enclosure or a particular environment. You are giving them the suitable parameters uh, which they require for its growth. So basically you're talking about the breeding, the rearing and the transplantation of fish by artificial means. And the important point to note out here is when we talk about pisciculture, we are referring specifically to fishes. Okay, so this is important. Uh, next, we move on to aquaculture. So this term we have also discussed as part of the lecture that we had uh, specifically dedicated to aquaculture. But still, let us, let us just have a quick look at what we had seen. So basically, this is a broader term and it uh, refers to the rearing of aquatic species. Okay, so when we talk about aquatic species, it includes both plants, aquatic plants and aquatic animals. So you're not, you're not restricting yourself to fishes alone. So just understand that because most of the times there's a confusion where even aquaculture is equated to pisciculture and uh, you can say that uh, aquaculture also involves the rearing of fish, but it is not only fish. Okay, there are other organisms or the species also that are involved. And uh, there's one another important characteristic uh, related to aquaculture that is you're not restricting yourself to any one environment. Okay, it can be grown in fresh water, it can be reared in a marine water or the brackish water, right? So there are a couple of environments that are used and the species also, uh, uh, there is a lot of variety of species as well. So kindly make note of this distinction out here. 
so now we have come to the other term that is mari culture so from the name itself you need to you know pick those clues uh, that can actually lead you to understand what it means so here if you see mari it is specifically referring to marine environment okay so what we are saying is when you culture the aquatic species in marine conditions or in the marine environment then that particular culturing of those species is referred to as mari culture right so that is the only difference out here so these are some of the three terms that we frequently encounter plus you need to know about ichthyology so now let's just proceed with the uh, discussion of the classification of fishery resources so fine uh, so what we shall be doing out here is uh, you need to just pause the video and have a look at this flow chart that is there on your screens right so uh, this is the entire uh, lesson you can say okay we are going to uh, open up each of the components that is presented in front of you then we are going to just see what it means and that is going to be the entire scope of this particular lecture which is the classification of fishery resources right so now if you see uh, on a broader level when we talk about fishery resource uh, there can be two types okay that can be fin fisheries and non fin fisheries so when i talk about fin fishery we mean uh, we are talking about those fishes that wear fins okay so uh, now you need to connect to the first lecture that we had actually seen uh, as part of our course uh, that was a lecture regarding the fish taxonomy right so we had seen uh, that uh, the fish that bear fins are placed under the superclass species right and there are two different classes to it we have seen the features and the difference between the two class it includes the bony fishes as well as the cartilaginous fishes right so when you are talking about those resources in particular they would be uh, put under the category of fin fisheries right so when you talk about non fin fisheries it would include all the other aquatic organisms as well like for example let us see uh, crabs right and you may also include prawns so all these organisms which are not under the superclass species right and um, for example if you talk about uh, crabs and prawns they basically come under the phylum arthropoda right so uh, those resources uh, are included under non fin fishery right so this is the first thing that you need to understand uh, now moving forward if you see the classification can also be done in another way that is it can be classified on capture uh, into capture fishery as well as culture fishery okay so now what do we mean by capture and culture so when you look at these terms you can get an idea as to we are classifying depending upon the way in which you are culturing or rearing a fish okay or maybe aquatic species uh, we will not limit ourselves to fish alone out here so when you talk about capture fishery what you are doing is uh, you are utilizing the available natural resources and you are just collecting the fish rather you're not going into the rearing of it for example you're going for fishing on a river right so you're just uh, using all the available fishing gears and you are capturing them okay so this is called capture fishery when you talk about culture fishery basically you are providing them an environment and you're rearing them okay it is cultivation process that is taking place we shall in the coming section uh, have a look at the definition and discuss this further so right now this much understanding is more than enough uh, now if you see under capture fishery there are two types that is marine and inland so as you can see this classification is actually based upon the environment from which the fishes are captured right so if you are doing it in the marine environment then obviously it is going to be marine capture fisheries and if you are doing it in inland waters like lakes rivers okay so those thing would come under inland category it's very as simple as that now if you talk about culture fisheries again depending upon the environment that we are uh, doing the rearing or ca uh, culturing the fishes that is in fresh water or whether you are using brackish water right there is also another type that is cage aquaculture now you need to go back to the aquaculture video and refresh your understanding where we had seen the various methods that are used um, for uh, cultivation in aquaculture right depending upon the enclosure we had a discussion regarding pen and cage okay pen and cage culture so you need to remember those things out here try and link it there uh, then there is the last category of culture fishery that is ornamental fishery from the name itself we can say for recreational purposes it is cultivated right so now let us just move forward have a look at the definition once again of capture and culture fishery and just strengthen our understanding of the difference between the two 
So now let's just quickly uh, graze through the definition. So when you come to capture fishery, it says you're capturing aquatic animals. It may be fin fish or shellfish from the natural water bodies. Okay, when you talk about natural water bodies, we are not restricting ourselves. It can be sea, it can be river, lake, pond, estuaries, uh, so many, right? And the purpose may be for food or ornamental purpose or for any other purpose that matters. Okay, now uh, if you see uh, there is not much of human intervention that is involved in capture fisheries you are not controlling the breeding process neither you are providing an environment to alter the breeding or the various other processes involved in the growth of the fish right so what you're doing is just you're making use of the available resources and you're just collecting fishes from the natural environment in which it is present right Next, you move on to culture fishery. So when you talk about culture fishery, it is based on the culture of that respective aquatic animal under the confined environment. So this is important. You are giving that particular species a confined environment. You are providing with the uh, supplementary feeds. You are giving the proper soil. You are giving proper temperature. You are making sure that uh, the breeding process takes place uh, without any uh, disadvantage or adverse effects, right? So all these things require major amount of human intervention, right? So this is culture fishery. Now, there is a third thing also that you need to know that is a capture based culture fishery. Now, you can uh, make out from the name that it is a kind of a combo of capture and culture, right? So what you're doing is you're mixing both the things. So initially you're collecting um, uh, the fishes or other uh, aquatic resources from the natural water bodies, right? After that, you're culturing that in the control environment before they are being harvested. So it is a mix of both these things. Uh, let us just discuss an example mostly if you see crabs and lobsters they are uh, collected from the sea and then they are fattened in the control environment okay so when they are brought to the control environment they are given with the calculated amount of feed and they are given with the proper environment so that their weight increases and their market value would subsequently increase with that right so these are the three things that you need to understand and once you have understood this going ahead would be very easier So here, uh, before we move forward, uh, there is a small revision that we need to do. We need to remind ourselves of the various classification of ocean zones that we had uh, studied as part of one particular lecture. So why we are going to have a look at this is because in the further sections, what is going to happen is you're going to be thrown with so many terms there and you would be able to make sense of those terms only when you are aware of these particular zones that you can see on your screens. So let's just quickly see uh, on the broader level if you see ocean is divided into pelagic zone and benthic zone okay when i say pelagic zone i'm talking about the water column of the ocean okay and when i talk about benthic zone it is the ocean floor now uh, there is yet another zone which usually uh, is not very distinctive but it is important that is littoral zone so kindly make sure that uh, you differentiate between this littoral zone, this pelagic and benthic. Okay. So littoral, littoral zone is basically the zone between the high tide and the low tide. So this is all these things we have discussed in our lecture before. So when you come to pelagic zone, it also has its division. Right. So based on the depth, uh, there are various zones that are present. That is epipelagic, mesopelagic, bathypelagic, abyssopelagic and hydalpelagic. Okay. So these are the various zones is a vertical classification. Now, when you move on to the horizontal classification of pelagic zone, you have two things. One is neritic and other is oceanic. Okay. When I say neritic zone, uh, we are talking about the water column that is present above the continental shelf. Right. And when I talk about oceanic uh, uh, classification of pelagic zone, we are talking about uh, the deeper water um, column of the ocean. Okay. And we had also seen that based on the amount of sunlight that stays, uh, the entire water column can be divided into photic and aphotic, right? Uh, photic can again be divided into euphotic and dysphotic. Uh, euphotic means a very well lit zone, 
right? Uh, most of the organisms uh, use the process of photosynthesis in that particular zone because uh, it is very efficient. Next, we have the dysphotic zone. Uh, it means poorly lit. Though the light penetrates through this zone, uh, the plants or aquatic plants are not able to make use of those uh, that particular sunlight in the process of photosynthesis. Okay. So this is a thing and aphotic is a dark zone completely. You do not have the prevalence of light there. So these are some of the things and we had also seen the division of the benthic zones uh, into supralittoral, littoral, sublittoral, then bethyl, uh, abyssal, huddle. So just have a look at these names, right? Now we shall move on and have a look at the classification. Let's continue. Okay, so uh, the previous flow chart that we had studied, uh, we had studied the capture and culture fishery methods. Now under capture, uh, there is there are two environments in which you can uh, involve yourself in collecting fishes. One can be the marine environment and the other can be the inland fisheries. Okay, so first we are going to take this particular component of us that is marine fishery. And for you to understand the marine fishery component, you should be aware of the various ocean zones. Very well, right? Link that properly. Now, uh, when you talk about marine fishery resources, there are three kinds of fishes that you can broadly, uh, uh, you know, come to a point to. One is pelagic zone, that is pelagic fish. Obviously, you need to know the meaning by now. So when I say pelagic fish, they are those fish that reside in the pelagic zone of the ocean. So now you will realize the importance of knowing those terms in beforehand. Uh, now you would quickly just it is going to be like a revision for you. Next, we have the second category that is a demersal fishes that is those fishes that are residing in the bottom of seas or lakes. OK, now this is a new term out here demersal. Next, if you see the third category being deep sea fishes, that is the below photic zone. So just now we had discussed that below photic zone, obviously you have the aphotic zone, the dark zone. Now, let us just, uh, we are not going into the details of each, you need to go and refer the notes, but let us just have a look at the various divisions and the important points. Uh, now, when we come to the pelagic uh, fishes, they can further be classified. Now, how can they be classified further? And you need to remember that we had seen the horizontal classification, right? We had seen that pelagic can be divided into neritic and the other one was oceanic, right? So again, the same division is done here. So when uh, we speak about those fishes, those are residing in the neritic zone, we call them as coastal fish or inshore fish. OK, so basically uh, this particular neritic zone, if you see, it is going to be very well lit. OK, sunlight uh, prevalence in this particular zone is going to be uh, very good. OK, because it is a topmost zone. It comes under epipelagic basically. Uh, next, if you see, this is the oceanic part of the pelagic zone. OK, so the fish that are residing in this part are known as open ocean or offshore fish. So friends, again, I'm reiterating myself that once you are clear with the ocean zones classification, you're not going to find any difficulty while going through these terms. OK, next, the second category. OK, just before moving on, when we talk about this oceanic fish, OK, they can actually have certain characters. So based upon that, they can be classified into true residents, partial residents or accidental residents. So what do we mean by these terms? When I say true residents, they are always residing in this uh, particular oceanic zone throughout their lives. OK, when we talk about partial residents, that means some part of their life is spent in the other other zones and they do back and forth. They keep migrating between the other zones as well as the oceanic zones. OK. Now, when we say accidental residents, we mean that uh, by chance, maybe because of the flow of water or maybe because of the movement of maybe some other fish, accidentally they enter into these zones. OK, they keep moving back and forth because of accident. OK, so this is a division out here. Next, let us move on to the demersal or uh, fishes. Now, these type of fishes are classified further into benthic fish and benthopelagic fish okay so when we say benthic fish uh, fish they usually rest on the sea floor they are called ground fish 
okay so their weight is such that they can without any effort rest in at the bottom of the sea floor okay so when we talk about benthopelagic fish they inhabit the water just above the bottom okay so they can actually swim there or maintain their balance without much effort so these are the two categories now uh, let's come to the third one okay that is the deep sea that is below photic zone obviously it is going to be darker there uh now just these two points if you can uh, to make it more effective you need to know that they inhabit basically the bathypelagic zone and the abyssopelagic zone what are these two zones uh, vertically if you classify the ocean uh, the uh, uh, region between 1000 meter to 4000 meters going to be bathypelagic and the region between 4000 and 6000 meter is going to be your abyssopelagic okay now the most common deep sea fish is this lantern fish just give you an, giving you an example here to make you uh, make it easier for you to remember now there are certain points two points in fact let us just discuss it. Uh, i found them important so i just mentioned it here so if you talk about epipelagic fish so what is epipelagic you know that it is a, a first zone when you classify the pelagic zone vertically it is between 0 to 200 meter right so basically this kind of this zone that we are talking about has less diversity okay uh, you can see that obviously it is well lit okay so you would uh, find those species that are able to prepare their own food in this particular zone but you do not find much of characteristics or variety that is found in this zone okay but but there is one other thing that you need to remember that more in numbers so the quantity actually makes up for the loss or the less amount of diversity that exists in the epipelagic zone okay next is one another point a demersal fish that is the bottom sea uh, fishes they contain little oil that is 1 to 4% but pelagic fish they contain up to 30% so just a fact okay a trivia out here you can just memorize this uh, you might uh, there might be a question on this as well so this is some of the information just uh, store it let's just move on further okay so we were just talking about uh, when we were talking about the uh, pelagic fish Uh, we had seen that the oceanic fish are can be partial residents accidental residents or true residents here there are certain examples out here right um, then if you see okay we were seeing that lantern fish is basically a common example for a uh, deep sea fish right now see uh, these lantern fish are actually partial residents of the ocean epipelagic zone see you can correlate here so what happens is during the day they hide in deep water so that is why you say it is a common example of uh, this one deep sea water fish okay but at night they migrate up to surface waters to feed so sometimes you know there can be a situation where a certain amount of fish can be both a pelagic fish it can also be a deep sea fish okay so you should not get confused like you know the same example can be used for both but you need to understand the difference that why are we using it uh, both the sides okay like this lantern fish example is a good one you can relate understand this if you are not able to you can pause the video kindly have a look at it again okay uh then there is another oceanic ocean uh, sunfish it is actually a true resident of the ocean epipelagic zone okay so do not get confused when we talk about ocean epipelagic zone okay so epipelagic zone is 0 to 200 meter okay so if this is a sea let us just you know draw if you not get confused out here okay so when you talk about the vertical classification let's keep it zero you move on till 200 meters and this entire region is going to be epipelagic uh, now horizontally if you see this particular portion which is towards the deeper side or towards more towards the inner part of the ocean that is referred to as oceanic pelagic zone or oceanic epipelagic so why epipelagic between 0 to 200 why oceanic because it is a part of the horizontal classification of the pelagic zone now this portion what would you call 
this portion is above the continental uh, below the continental shelf sorry above the continental shelf not below above so this is going to be the neritic zone okay so kindly don't get confused uh, just try pause the video have a, uh, a refresh your memory and you will be able to understand this okay next uh, you have a whale shark out here this is another resident of the ocean epipelagic zone okay so these are some of the examples that you can see let's just move on now uh, so we have completed the portion of a marine environment or marine fishery so uh, till now we have been looking uh, on the aspect of capture fisheries where we are uh, utilizing the available natural resources we are catching fishes basically if you talk in layman's term right but that catching is not just one or two we are doing it in bulk for various purposes it can be ornamental purpose it can be for food purpose right so it depends uh, upon uh, it is subjective okay so we had seen that that kind of capture fishery can be performed in marine environment uh, we had a very uh, detailed look at that okay now next environment in which it can be performed is the inland fisheries okay now again if you see inland fisheries it means the inland waters that are available it also can be of various types okay there can be rivers that are there there can be reservoirs there can be estuaries wetlands so again this division is based upon what kind of environment is used okay on the broader level it is inland fisheries okay uh, but if you go to the micro level we can use the existing river system okay there can be a use of man made reservoirs you can use the natural system of estuarine as an a closed environment you can make use of wetlands for culturing the uh, for capturing the fisheries okay so here we are not culturing we are capturing okay that you need to understand uh, so when you come to riverine uh, basically there are in five important riverine systems in india one is in this ganges brahmaputra east flowing riverine system and west riverine system okay what we are going to do is as part of this particular lecture we are not going to specifically name the species we have mentioned in the concept note kindly just a note at least some 3 to 4 major species that are present in each of the river, riverine systems that is more than uh, enough for us uh, then uh, we are going to have a look at reservoir in a detailed manner Uh, in the subsequent section uh, then moving on to estuary if you see it is a semi enclosed coastal body of water okay uh, which has a connection with the open sea okay so there is a dilution of the fresh water there with the sea water so you need to understand it's a mix of both okay so again uh, again depending upon the environment we have classified so we are capturing the fish that are present in estuary environment then moving on to wetlands uh, wetland if you see you can call these as a kidneys of the earth system okay they uh, help in purifying the water as well uh, we have given a very very detailed explanation as to what are estuaries and wetlands in our uh, content sheets so basically that's not going to be the scope of this particular lecture we are going to specifically concentrate on the fishery resources out here so basically if you talk about wetland you can tell that the, the patch of land which is uh, most of the times okay sometimes permanently as well or uh, most of the time is submerged under water okay so you can say there's a meeting of water and land that takes place there okay the wetlands also can be fresh water they can be brackish or they can be saline so uh, when we talk about fresh water we know that salinity is going to be zero the amount of salt present is zero when we say brackish it is going to be partly salty uh, nearly up to 30 parts per thousand of salt uh, dissolved salt that are present and if it is more than that that is a marine environment that is saline okay so now we shall uh, quickly have a look at this reservoirs these are man made systems okay so what you're doing is you're obstructing the surface flow okay or you're erecting a dam in uh, on a river or you may also use a stream okay and that becomes an artificial environment but you are utilizing the existing resources only what you're doing you're just coming up with an obstruction okay you're just erecting a particular divide because of which the water gets collected and then you can start collecting your fish resources from that particular area okay 
Now, when you say small reservoirs, they have an area of less than 1000 hectares. So, this is an important data, just keep in mind. Now, this kind of feature uh, is common in the rural landscape of India. Okay, so there are certain states which specifically follow these kind of systems. Uh, now, if you see this last point is particularly important. Uh, the small reservoirs basically constitute the prime inland fishery resource of India. Why is it so? Because if you see it uh, encompasses vast area. If you count the entire India and a huge production, okay, nearly 1.5 million hectares of areas used for small reservoir category. And it has huge potential, uh, production potential because nearly 150 kg per hectare per year. You can see how much it is uh, in use in India, right? So now uh, there is a particular uh, formula that you would find in the content sheets. Uh, so basically what happens is whenever you are going for these kind of man-made systems, we need to actually calculate the stocking rate. Okay. So how much, how many fishes do you need to stock per unit area of it? Okay, you need to know that because you cannot uh, just indiscriminately start uh, stocking fishes in that particular area because it is going to be uh, have a detrimental effect. Okay, so uh, now let us have a look at um, the formula out here. Now there's one more thing uh, that you can link here that when you talk about small reservoirs, it is a kind of a combination of capture and culture because what you're doing is you are uh, not specifically bringing in fish feed there. Already the resources are there, the fishes are present, you are just creating an obstruction and the fishes get collected out there. But you are at the same time trying to uh, make sure that the yield, the required yield is uh, obtained from the area that you have enclosed. Okay, so kind of uh, a human intervention is involved in this kind of a process. Okay, so you need to keep that in mind as well. Uh, now this particular formula to calculate the stocking rate is uh, basically given uh, called the formula of welcome okay just uh, keep this name in mind now you don't need to go very detailed into this uh, uh, formula just have a rough look at it uh, so here there's one particular term that is this p which is used here do not go uh, on the alphabet just understand what it is uh, basically we are referring to the natural annual potential yield of a water body so now what happens out here is uh, because we are already using the existing resources that are present, that particular resource would have a natural potential yield that it contains. How much fishes does it have, uh, whether they are productive or not. Okay, So these parameters are very uh, uh, varies. Uh, depending upon the resource that is being used okay so this particular formula p is uh, uh, 3.984 me and all those things mei 0.6374 okay so when i say mei we mean by morphoedific index okay so basically what you need to do is just have a look at this formula have an understanding about morphoedific index this is a particular index which takes into account the various uh, factors like you know uh, the uh, physical features of the fish okay and the other environmental factors so all those factors are taken into account and this particular morphoedific index is computed okay so uh, I would just suggest you not to go in deeper into this because this is not going to be important for us but just have an idea that there is a process of calculating the stocking rate for small reservoir and this particular formula is frequently in use for it. So now we have come to the last part that is regarding the culture fishery. So we are done with the capture part and now we come to culture part uh, because this particular mode of capture, uh, this particular mode of rearing fishes uh, uh, is actually in trend and uh, we can actually modify the fish depending upon our requirements. So this is mostly preferred. Uh, now, based on the environment in which they are done, uh, they can be classified into freshwater, brackish water, cage aquaculture and ornamental fishery, right? So now what we are going to have a look at is under freshwater, if you see, there is a specific composite fish culture that is done. Okay, and this is carp culture. You will not understand it right now because we haven't had a discussion on this yet. Uh, then also we can go for prawn culture. Okay, prawns can also be cultured in freshwater. 
then for when you move on to brackish water that is it is partly salty it has a, a concentration of salt up to 30 parts per thousand right so under that we can go in for shrimp culture okay then when you say shrimps they these are basically those prawns that are not strictly restricted to fresh water okay so when i call it prawn it is fresh water prawns okay and when i call it shrimp it is those prawns that are usually usually found in the marine environment or brackish water okay you need to know the difference don't get confused between these two so what we are uh, in the examination point of view these three things are very important your carp culture your prawn culture and your shrimp culture okay so what is going to happen is you need to know all the technical parameters like what is the rearing period okay what are the various ph level that is required for the optimum growth now uh, so these are some of the important data points that you would encounter while going through these cultures now uh, as part of this lecture we are not going to take these three things as a separate uh, lecture we are going to have a look at this so friends with this we have come to the end of this video where we had a discussion elaborately upon the classification of fishery resources so uh, we are yet to discuss about uh, the three types of culture like uh, the prawn the carp culture and the shrimp culture so we shall take it up as part of the next lecture till then friends thank you so much and happy learning